Yes, yeah, so when uh, Maurizio called me, I couldn't resist. Uh, at the same time, I thought, well, I don't, or I haven't yet, designed a collection of lingerie. It is one of my dream projects. I've done some lingerie uh, design for myself. Uh, some of you may know I make a lot of clothing for myself. Um, and in part because um, I'm sort of ortai. I'm a big girl. And uh, thanks. I think I'll be OK. You do it? OK. If I need you, I'll call you. Yeah. Um, I have a long history with lingerie, again, because of my body type. And uh, we'll talk about this, or I'll talk about this as we go along. But I did want to start um, by talking a little bit about the core of my work, which is uh, a collection of erotic jewelry, which I started in 1992. Uh, at the time, it was called Sado Chic. I coined the term Sado Chic. At the time I did it, uh, anything that was associated with S&M or fetishism was not considered anything uh, fashionable. Uh, there are a few coincidences, which I'll talk about uh, along the way. But as you can imagine, when I started to do this, working directly from the body, using the body as a reference, um, there weren't any venues for what I was doing, no classical retail venues. So after a um, first sis, uh, series of presentations to my classical clients, which were retail clients around the world, including Barney's and uh, Liberty's and Printon and uh, Kashiyama in Japan, et cetera, uh, it was pretty clear to me that it was a little bit too early 1992. So I continued to do my classic, uh, or more classic, I called it classic collections, for the fashion system. But in secret, I was designing objects for a very small group of private collectors, and um, many of them were hardcore fetishists. And uh, they were coming to get unique pieces, and it was an exciting moment. Again, uh, by the time I was 13, I was a um, fully formed woman with a uh, 34 double D uh, obligation, whereas lots of my your girlfriends at the age of 13 could opt out on bras if they liked. I couldn't. And uh, I have actually a precedence with lingerie, which is kind of interesting because it starts when I'm seven years old. And I was going to a school where every season, every year, there was a nurse that would come to the school and they would have us bend over and expose our spinal cords in seek of scoliosis. Well, I happened to be diagnosed at the age of seven with acute scoliosis, which is where the curvature of the spine goes in the wrong direction. And uh, I was diagnosed and immediately fitted with a medical corset. And it was kind of interesting, this medical corset. I mean, I didn't really understand what was going on, but it was pink, and I felt straight in it, and I felt contained, and I felt kind of good in it. And they sent me home with a letter to my father that said, your daughter needs to be corseted medically. When he saw that, he said, well, you're not going to wear a corset. That's absolutely out of the question. You're going to walk with a stack of books on your head, and I promise you that will make you straight. Well, it must have, because every year I got fitted for the corset, Every year I went home with the letter to my father saying, your daughter needs to be put into a medical corset. She's got extreme scoliosis. And every year I would continue to work, walk in the evenings with books on my head. I'm not kidding, okay? So my relationship to corseting started at the age of seven. It happened once a year until the age of, how do I do that, is that right? Until the age of 15, I, I put in a picture of my dear friend, Mr. Pearl, and you'll see several of the corsets that I wear in the images that are uh, in my presentation. They're made by Mr. Pearl, including the pink one on uh, my right. Um, and Pearl, we'll talk about him a little bit more because he's definitely a figure that cannot be ignored. When I was uh, 16 years of age, I started to work in a, in a vintage clothing shop. It was 1982, something like that. And uh, there was an enormous section of this vintage clothing st uh, store that was dedicated to lingerie. And I started to become fascinated by that section of the shop. And uh, not only because it was pretty, but also because when I would put myself into the vintage bras, 
I felt comfortable. And I felt as if finally I'd found the lingerie that I couldn't find in the shops. I also was fascinated by the fact that it would shape me. And as you were talking, Francoise, about the return of shapewear, uh, I, I fell in love with girdles. And in fact, girdles became the uh, mainstay of my wardrobe. And uh, I was told a couple of times in high school to please go home and get dressed. Uh, <laughs> but when I could, it was girdles and stockings and silhouette. I was fascinated by the fact, in fact, if we look at the center image, uh, I understood that that was, my, that was an ideal silhouette, this tiny little waist, and I figured out how it was to be done, and it was corseting and girdles. And I was full-fledged uh, and fully fitted by the time I was 16 and a half. I loved nylon stockings, and I would do anything to get into um, yard sales, attic sales, uh, any sort of source of stockings, particularly nylons, which are hard to find. I still have some good finds here in Paris, thank goodness. Uh, and I collect nylons still today. Um, alongside of this fascination with uh, the fetish undergarments, which became my outerwear, uh, I also uh, became fascinated with, of course, shoes. And I think that when we speak of lingerie, we speak of shoes, we speak of certain garments, corseting. Something's happening in the body. I'm fascinated by what happens in the body when we uh, slide into something, whether it be a shoe or a corset or a piece of my jewelry, because there's a lot of crossovers uh, I find in the, in the world of lingerie and in what I do with, with metal work. But shoes have the same effect. If I'm corseted, then my, the way that I move through space is very different than if I'm wearing a jogging suit and tennis shoes. Same thing for heels. I put on a heel, and suddenly it's like I'm called to attention. I'm called to presence. And at a very uh, young age, I understood also that the effect that was having on me was also having an effect on the people around me. So if I'm going to be the strong, liberated woman, listen, we still got some work to do, I need to wear a little bit of heel. If I come in in frumpy tennis shoes, I'm not going to get my job done somehow. No? So I understood really early on that the way that I was clothed or, or fitted or maintained was also going to affect the way I move through space and relate with myself and others. For me, one of the most important things about lingerie is comfort, though. It has to be comfortable and pretty, and this is where the challenge of the industry is. The same time that I was doing research uh, and, and sometimes doing buying for this vintage clothing store, which also had a section of um, uh, English leather and S&M gear and uh, very sexy shoes. It was the time of Nana. -na. It was the beginning of the 80s and uh, what we called a fuck me boots. They had a big selection of them. And I was shopping for the shop in the vintage uh, places like Salvation Army and again yard sales and things like that. And I came across a stock of Bizarre magazine. And this little magazine, which is a teeny little illegal magazine from the 1950s, was founded by a man named John Willie. And I think that John Willie, uh, well, he was obviously a full-blown fetishist. In fact, he got kicked out, kicked out of the National uh, Army and uh, ended up leaving England and moving to New York in the 50s, which is where he actually did Bizarre, uh, because the, um, the generals in the army did not like the choice of his wife who was a bit of a pinup. And uh, he, he illustrated fashion articles, lingerie, and, and garments which we now associate with fetishism in such a way that sometimes you might even say that, um, that it was Christian Le Bouton, for example, in the bottom, or Chantal. It, it was a language that was codified. And I think that today, thanks to Tashin as well, uh, bizarre is no longer something that's uh, that's illegal, and the lexicon of, of, of seduction through the accessories or through fashion or through, um, uh, I guess, an attitude that's imposed by those garments has come to the surface and it's affecting the entire fashion system. It's, it's, about, it's quite a while now. But for me, John Willie was important because he also made me understand that my size, my Amazon type size, and my red hair, which was uh, teased and, and, and caused me pain throughout my childhood, was something that was actually appreciated by some people. 
So uh, I, again, was uh, fascinated by this idea, and still am, the idea of wearing under gear is outer gear. And I wasn't alone, uh, there was a predecessor, and I call her the mother of punk and the mother of, of uh, cutting edge fashion in a lot of ways, who is Vivian Westwood. And Vivian um, brought uh, alongside Jean-Paul later uh, the idea of underwear as outerwear to the forefront. And she's someone who I've always loved and admired, also because Vivian is one of the few designers that I could wear without wearing a bra. Because she incorporates the bra, she incorporates the, the, the structuring necessary into the garment herself. I love Vivian for that. Um, Jean-Paul is also someone who I love and admire and have worked with over the years, who has a, uh, He's continued this and, and made it even more couture somehow than, than Vivian, the idea of wearing your underwear uh, on the outside. In fact, it keeps on continuing on. This is a, um, a fashion show that I did for John Paul. I think it was 2012. And I am wearing a bullet bra and a girdle and I think my own nylon stockings. In 1992, uh, Versace did his bondage chic collection and he really pulled out of the underground, out of the dungeon, out of the S&M hideaways, a vocabulary that was explicitly fetishistic. And by chance, that was the year that I did Sato Chic. Um, throughout the years, I'd been someone who was doing research through my own body. And the lingerie and, and I think corseting, corseting have very similar languages. And I was fascinated by the fact that Versace would actually go so far <laughs> to do the bondage sheet collection. I thought it was the beginning of a revolution. And I was wrong. Uh, because when I started to present the more erotic pieces to my clients, it was, it was sort of like a foot down. In fact, I continued to hide what I was doing until 2001. Uh, and after uh, the Twin Towers were hit, I felt as if, if I was going to design anything, then it would be to make the world a better place. I'm an idealist. I still believe that there's hope for that. Making the world a better place through our, through our work as creatives. This was the piece that I designed in 1992. It was made actually to be shared with another person. And it was thanks to this piece of jewelry that I understood by passing the piece on, by wearing the bracelet myself and passing the ring to someone, I realized how powerful an object could be in terms of connecting people, connecting each other. Clearly, it's not something that you would do with somebody that you don't like kind of a lot. And something happens when I, when I, when I handed my ring to my friend, I felt almost like a, a, a vibration of energy between myself and him through this object. And that got me started. And I started to design around the Sato Sex Sheet collection a series of attachments, a series of objects that can actually be removed, kind of like in lingerie, you know, you can remove a strap or tighten it up, whatever. And uh, the collection evolved. This is 1992 to 2001. 2001, I present in Paris to my retailers around the world, and they all disappeared except for one and said to me, what are you doing? This is kinky, we didn't know you were SM. This is, we can't sell this in our shops. How are we going to explain it to people? And I said, I'm going to help you. And they were like, no. So I realized that it was still a little bit too early. And I started to work on uh, my book in 2005. It came out in 2013 with Rizzoli International. And because I wanted it to be democratic, and it ended up being a, a more of a didactic book than anything else, I removed my designs from it. And I spoke in general about um, the instruments of different kinds of loving and full body stimulation. And the collection continues to be the base of all the things that I do. I, uh, this is a second skin. Francois, you mentioned second skins in your, these are my second skins and they're actually built on the body as if lingerie would be built. It uh, has no clasps or closures because uh, it's actually the musculature of the hand or the feet or whatever part of the body is being dressed. Uh, that holds it in place. And I did a series of these. Sometimes my jewelry breaks the barriers of the actual size of what you'd expect a piece of jewelry to be, and it can almost act like lingerie. It can go to bed with you, it can dress you, it can, you're dressed but undressed, no? 
which is, I think, one of the wonderful things about lingerie. The closest thing that I've come yet to designing in lingerie, in the world of lingerie, is uh, the body chain, which is a slip and in an upper part, which can be connected together in uh, sterling silver or 18 karat gold. And um, this is actually an image of it on a mannequin that I made of my friend Dita Von Tees, who I think is doing very interesting things in terms of vintage revival and making lingerie for women who are uh, shapely, and which has always been, again, a problem for me. Uh, I'm bigger than the norm, and it's not always easy to find things that fit properly. And Dita's done a wonderful job of reviving uh, an image of, of, of woman in her full force. The, the, the mannequin in leather is, again, uh, a, a, body ca a body cast Dita. She was corseted by Pearl, and uh, she said always to me, Bettina, that was the most hardcore thing I'd ever done in my life. And I said, it's because you broke the rules. She wasn't supposed to eat before she went and got herself cast, but bow to, bound basically by Mr. Pearl, who's into extreme corseting and into architecting the body which I'm extremely fascinated by. And back to Second Skins, um, I have an issue with uh, designing things that are not functional somehow. And I think, again, also for lingerie, I think there's a, there's a question of functionality that can't be ignored. In the moment that a bra is just pretty and you have more than a B cup, then there's a problem, no? And I believe also that a great uh, bra, a great corset, a, a well-made piece of lingerie is the basis and the foundation of a fabulous wardrobe. Because if it's not, if, you're, if your undergear is not fitting properly, your overgear, no matter how fabulous it is, it's going to look horrible. Um, yes, second skins. Uh, changing the way that we uh, move through space is something that fasc fascinates me. This is a Minerva, and it's made to straighten uh, the spine as much as a Mr. Pearl corset could do. Uh, the Boudoir Bible, uh, Bible allowed me to uh, reach a wider public, and uh, I do work in the luxury business, and um, sometimes my pieces are uh, made in limited editions, sometimes they're one-offs, and uh, never are they industrialized. I believe in uh, maintaining the arts and crafts in the countries where I work and produce, mostly in Italy. Uh, and I think it's important to maintain certain standards, just as Francois explained in the lingerie industry, there's uh, a lot of quality control, and, uh, and the artisanal aspect of my work is um, fundamental to the final outcome of the product. The book is now published in, uh, in four languages. We're going on to the fifth in the autumn with Russian. Uh, and uh, these are a couple of illustrations uh, by Francois Bertou, who illustrated my book. I steered away from photography because I knew that it would immediately become pornographic, and I wanted to avoid that. And that's all I have to say. If you have any questions, I'm here. Thank you.